Okay, welcome to the, the first video of the community seed selection project for collards. I've got Ira Wallace here on the line who's gonna share a little bit of information. And really this video is just gonna aim to introduce you to Ira and Southern Exposure, myself and uh, the Utopian Seed Project, and then this new community seed selection project that we're launching right now. And many of you watching this probably already have seeds and are maybe wondering what to do with them. So we're going to try and address all that in this short video today. I thought it would be good, even though most people probably know Ira and or Southern Exposure, but this is going to go on the YouTube. So maybe we'll get some people that don't know us. Uh, if you could just give a quick introduction, Ira, to yourself and your seed company. Hi, I'm Ira Wallace with Southern Exposure Seed Exchange. We're a regional and a growing seed company in Center and Mineral, Virginia. Uh, and we uh, specialize in varieties that do well in the Southeast and Mid-Atlantic regions. Uh, and uh, the home of Southern Exposure is Acorn Community Farm, which is an intentional community. And we run the whole thing cooperatively and have 70 cooperating farms that produce seeds for Southern Exposure uh, and lots of friends like you hmm. who are interested in seed saving. And even if they aren't yet doing it, they're interested in knowing about it. Uh, so that's a, a little bit, you know, you can visit us online and we have over 700 varieties of heirloom and open pollinated seeds. Uh, yeah. And I'm known as a collared lady by some people because I've these last few years been very involved in the collared project and other related things. Yeah, hey, and I, that's probably one of the reasons I'm really excited to have you on board with this, this next step. Um, so my name's Chris Smith and I run the Utopian Sea Project. We're down in Asheville, North Carolina. And I set up this project just a couple of years ago to really uh, explore and celebrate biodiversity in food and farming. So we're doing a lot of variety trials with traditional southern crops and that led me to growing a lot of okra, a lot of collards, southern peas and actually Ira and Southern Exposure has been like a supporter of the work I've been doing even before I started setting up the Utopian Sea Project back in my early okra days. So I'm, I'm very grateful and excited to continue working with you, Ira. We've both mentioned the heirloom collar project already. I wondered if Ira, you could give like the uh, the summary pitch of what is the heirloom collar project? Well, it started with uh, two geographers and a USDA uh, plant breeder on a road trip to explore heirloom collards. And they had uh, sent out uh, letters to extension agents all over the collared belt. And uh, they were driving around for uh, in the winters in the late 80s and uh, early 90s and into the late 90s, uh, collecting seeds of uh, heirloom collards. And I love uh, Ed Davis, and they wrote a book about it called Collards, uh, A Southern Tradition from Seed to Table, which got me all excited. I mean, I did not know. I have been growing collards for a long time and I did not know, you know, that there were big ones and light yellow ones and curly ones and purple ones. And it was amazing. Uh, and so uh, I was lucky enough right after I got introduced to this book to go down to Charleston where they happened to be doing an observational trial of 60 of the varieties that had been uh, collected from stewards by Davis and Morgan. And that really got me going. I was like, and uh, Tor uh, Jorgensen at uh, Seed Savers Exchange. And I talked about this shortly afterwards at a conference and we started getting together uh, an idea of what we might do. And uh, Seed Savers got asked for as many of the 90th sessions that had been uh, put in from the project as possible. 
And so all, so they got some varieties at Southern Exposure and at Seed Savers, we grew out all of them that first year. And uh, I don't know when we met you, Chris, you put up somewhere uh, about then. Yeah, at the Heritage Harvest Festival, right? At the Heritage Harvest Festival, which uh, I helped co-found at Monticello. And uh, yeah, Chris was there, maybe talking okra, I would imagine. Probably. Uh, <laughs> And uh, we told him about it and he jumped in, helped put up a website for uh, heirloomcollards.org where we could have people meet the collards and get a little bit of the story of this great diversity of one of the uh, brassicas that was developed in the Southeast, even though the original genetic material came from England, it was underappreciated and considered you know, something not so good. And we brought it up to its sublime heights in the Southeast. <laughs> it's pretty exciting. So I guess fast forward that to um, last year where like, the Elum Collar Project got like a, a kind of a revamp boost, um, Seed Saves Exchange uh, re-engaged. And we, last year we basically did two, two big things with the Elum Collar Project. One was we had a large kind of uh, 2020 trial where we had eight trial sites growing 20 varieties from that collection and I was lucky enough to be one of those sites uh, here and Southern Exposure was a site as well so we, we were spread around the country and then I, I forget the actual number but it was over 200 people were participating as home gardeners and they just were growing a random selection of those three varieties. So it was a very exciting year. We we were everyone was getting excited about collards. It culminated in the heirloom, well, the collard week that we put on collaboratively with the Culinary Breeding Network. And we had a whole host of great speakers talking about celebrating, educating around collards. You can see them online. I'll make sure I post a link uh, for you to follow that. So that was 2020 last year. I had those 20 collards in my field. I also had a, another one, a, a 21st variety, which is a, a fairly special variety that we've been growing within our own project. So we had 21 varieties growing. My intention was never to save seeds from these collards because collards are obligate outcrosses. They'll, they'll share pollen and they can't receive it unless it's genetically different. So with the way I had my trial set out with two replications, there was just, you know, all the colored varieties were all mixed up and right next to each other. And there was going to be no way for me to maintain varietal purity without a whole bunch of effort with, you know, I would have had to do cages and introduce pollinators and, and all sorts of stuff that I wasn't able to do for 21 varieties. So my intention wasn't to save seeds. It was just to experience and document these collards. Seed Savers Exchange, Southern Exposure are doing a great job of stewarding these varieties and having that heirloom preservation aspect of the project. And actually in 2021, that's been a main goal of the heirloom collar project has been to get more stewards involved with the, like looking after these varieties. So that, that wasn't what I was doing. Uh, and actually I was just gonna turn the field over in the spring but we got down to eight Fahrenheit and about 30% of the crop was wiped out by that cold low. But like most, of, well, not most, but a majority of the field survived. And I looked at these collards and was like, no, everyone told me they were going to die. I didn't have any protection over them. It was freezing cold and a good chunk of these collards survived. And I was like, well, let's just allow these collards to grow up and be themselves and see if they survive all the way through. And with very little attention from me, we had uh, prolific flowering. I think I saved about three pounds of seeds. And I started thinking of all these intercross collards as this potential for a beautifully diverse mix of collards that had already proven some level of winter survivability. Uh, and I was just excited to take these collards forward and see what that mix would become. At the same time, I was doing a community seed selection project for okra and was getting really excited about all the engagement I was getting on the okra project. So I've got a Facebook group and a YouTube 
uh, playlist for the okra and it just felt really empowering to have all these people sharing photographs and knowledge all over the country growing okra and I was like well we could do this for collards as well and I have this diverse mix we could share it all out there and that brought me back to Ira um, knowing that they were excited about the collards and may be able to support me in distributing the seeds and being a part of this idea and one question I have for you, Ira, is, you know, what what is it about this idea of having a broad community seed selection project that was exciting enough for Seed Savers Exchange to go to all the time and effort to like pack these seeds and get them all distributed? Well, this kind of struck me like the early days of uh, the Seed Savers Exchange before there was a seed company, before there was a Southern Exposure Seed Exchange. But when there were just uh, members and individuals sharing knowledge and getting and seeds and getting excited and learning things and getting stuff out of grin. And it was like when you mentioned it, I was like, yeah, that'll be so much fun. And other people who didn't get to, you know, play in the 80s and 90s will get a chance to have that experience of uh, learning about, you know, collards or you know and maybe we'll do other things in the future uh and uh at the same time sharing it with all their uh cd friends so when you said it i thought we can do this and we pulled it together in like i don't know a couple of weeks it was crazy yeah you guys really rallied um, to make it happen so i re i really appreciate that we got the seeds out kind of right towards like the end of the season. And we're gonna get into a little bit of planting tips from Ira um, in a moment. But I, I just wanted to say before we got there that this, this is an invite to everyone that's bought seeds from Southern Exposure to, to be a part of this community seed selection project. Although it's, it's not an obligation. We're, I'm excited that you're gonna to get to experience growing a very broad diversity of seeds. I think within those seeds, there's potential for you to start selecting uh, for whatever you want, really. There's, there's so much diversity you could select for uh, taste or color or size, or in, in our case, we're going for kind of all of them, really. We want this beautifully diverse uh, color structure, leaf shape, et cetera hyper cold tolerance so they can survive in really really cold conditions and that's part of our kind of like uh wish for having a resilient food systems uh but then also tasty we're really interested in the collards being absolutely delicious one of our one of my board members is chef ashley shanti and she's been really engaged with the collards from the beginning and i know that she's going to be part of my selection process here um, and i would encourage other people to be selecting for that too but i say all this that we want people to engage with this seed selection and Ira and I, and we'll bring in other voices, will be here as guides to take you through growing and seed saving and selecting all the way through to seeds. Um, but, you know, no, no pressure if you don't. So I, I'd love you to engage, enjoy the college, share pictures. And if we can get some community selected seeds at the end of this to come back into the communal pot to continue driving this diverse population forward, then all the better. Um, but really it's about in, enjoying the collards and participating and learning and engaging as a community of seed savers moving, moving forward. So with that said, um, whether you're gonna save seeds or not at the end of this, you're certainly gonna wanna start those seeds. So I'm gonna kick it back to Ira who has written multiple books on, on growing food and seeds and, and is very much an expert in this area. And I would love Ira, just for you to share a, you know, a couple of tips to help people be successful. Like what are the common challenges that people are gonna come across or issues they'll face? And if we can head them off early on, then hopefully we'll have a, a stronger project going forward. Uh, well, let's see. Uh, starting collards in the, for your fall garden have a couple of little pitfalls that you want to avoid. One is, there is every insect, uh, including uh, cabbage moths that are flying around waiting to, you know, 
lay their eggs and have their uh, little caterpillars just chow down on your collard. However, that you can uh, prevent this by covering it with a uh, row cover or uh, back in the day before row cover, we used to use uh, a lining from ladies' dresses. Uh, look at that. <laughs> yeah, uh, and to cover them. And I often would actually use window screen uh, again back before uh, you know spun polyester row cover was uh, available. And I and I say covering them. Uh, not everyone does does that, but it just saves you a lot of hand picking, day after day after day. So that's that's one thing. And when they get a little strong, you know and sturdy more like four weeks to six weeks old, then it's not as much of a problem. But I actually try to keep mine covered until they come to the top of uh, my hoop. So I'm not going out there and worrying about the cabbage worms. Uh, another thing is it's hot. Now, even though uh, collards actually grow better in cool weather, their highest germination is in the 80s. So you just need to, I, I like to start them in the shade of a taller crop, like, you know, corn that's at the end of its season and stuff and little seedling bed, or you can actually set yourself up trays and uh, put them, some people actually bring out their lights and put them in the basement because it's warm, but not as hot as it can be sometimes outside. And I usually space them out more than I do seedlings to begin with, because you want them to come up and grow fast so that you can transplant them like at four weeks or so and get them growing in the ground uh, for the fall, especially when you're starting them now, as opposed to late, you know, July or early August. I mean, we're in September, so you want to give them that uh, little boost and covering them with the row cover against uh, cabbage moths also uh, protects them from drying out when you have windy days and makes the night temperatures, the like when you have a night like last night that was 57 degrees to so just keep them growing up fast. Cause you wanna get as much growth as you can between now and the end of October when the warm days are few and far between. Um, so that's what I'm saying. Collars are easy. Keep them from the bugs from eating them up. Uh, you know, keep them uh, watered until they uh, have emerged for sure. And then your usual once a week. But fortunately in the fall, usually the sky will take care of that once a week. Awesome. And then we, we also have uh, a Facebook group, which is just facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash community seed selection. Uh, I'll share a link for that as well. And there's been a great community of people in there that are supporting each other. So you're welcome to reach out to us with questions, but you can also uh, post within that group and we can all support each other in this project. I, I want to answer one last question before we wrap up here, because a, a few people have already asked it from people that have received seeds. And the question is, do, if you're participating in the community seed selection pro part of this project, then do you need to worry about other brassicas? So we know that collards are brassica oleracea. And so if there are other brassica oleraceas, of which there are many actually, right? We've got like cauliflower, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, kohlrabi, um, cabbage, kale, collards. Am I missing any? No, that, that's, that's pretty that's good. Yeah. So, so there's a lot of brass <laughs> colorations. <laughs> and if if our collards are flowering at the same time as another brass coloracea because they're insect pollinated, then there's a chance that there's going to be cross pollination. And so the question was, uh, am I worried about other brassicas crossing? And my answer so far has been, and I'd be interested to know, Ira, if you've got anything to throw into this, 
because we're developing this really broad mix of genetics, then I'm not really that worried if other collards that you happen to be planting cross into this. Because, you know, if they're good collards that, and they maintain selection over multiple years, then they're just going to add genetics to our mix. And actually, I would really want to see more purples and blues in the mix than currently exists. So if you happen to be growing Alabama blue or something like that, then I would love to see that cross into the mix and capture those genetics too. That would be super fun. Kale also, I'm, I'm not too worried about kale. You know, it's a leafy green. If that ends up in our mix, then, you know, eh, well, I'm, I'm not that concerned. And then all of those other uh, Brassica oleracea, unless you're specifically saving for seed, then there's not a high chance that many of you are gonna be having flowering cabbage or flowering broccoli because you know we we for broccoli we eat the flower head right so not that many people let them go to seed and then things like the um things that bolt really quickly like um the chinese cabbage uh th that's a different species so we, we don't need to worry about that one crossing so in my, you know, back of the envelope type calculations, there's probably not that much to be worried about in terms of this, like maintaining like really pure genetic genetics within this population, mainly because it's already so diverse. So that's kind of my take on it right now. You know, we're probably going to discuss and work as we go forward. We, we're not going to be saving seed until next year. Um, so things might come up between now and then, but for now, I wouldn't worry about it. Just plant the collards and plant whatever else you're planting, and we can kind of work it out as we go. Do you, do you have any th thoughts on that, Ira? That, that uh, a lot of home seed savers, that's what they do. But they do, you know, go through and do a quick cut down of things that are not good anyways, that would cost, uh, you don't have like large amounts of random stuff in your mix so basically once we get to next spring we could talk through maybe things that would cross that we don't want in the mix and and cull them if we're going through the seed saving yeah 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 things like you know kohlrabi or something that you you know is a little different <laughs> yeah i would agree with that i don't really want kohlrabi mixing into this <laughs> this mix i don't know what that would do but um Cool. Okay. Um, so for now, don't worry about it. Just put, plant the collards and, um, and we should be good to go. Um, so I think, I think that's covered the main basis for this kind of intro video. Uh, we'll be kind of checking back in and, and hopefully guiding you through. We'll be sharing our own collards that we've got planted as well. So we'll do some videos from the field. And if you've got questions, then feel free to email me or post them in that Facebook group that I'm gonna to link to and we can uh, definitely get them answered as we go forward. Ira, thank you so much for being part of this project and sharing your knowledge and wisdom. This is gonna be lots of fun.